All right, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy, <laughs> Kearney here. We're going to be talking about science today and the scientific method and uh, one of the uh, biggest crises in science to have uh, come down the pike, uh, maybe since ever, maybe since uh, Francis Bacon invented bacon. <laughs> so let's get going. The uh, We're going to be talking, yeah scientific method and the reproducibility crisis or the reproduction crisis. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> how many people here have seen like one of these posters before, right? They typically are up in like, uh, these are stolen from Google, but you know, they're, they're typically up in like your middle school, you know, library or something like this. Uh, yeah, you've seen these things before. And so uh, what's interesting is like people will talk about the scientific method, this scientific method scientific method yeah this is uh, you know handed down uh, to us from on high this is the way that science is done and uh it's kind of it's kind of bs because if you look at uh all these different posters you might start noticing some similarities and also noticing some differences right so every physical scientific class ever right this is the scientific method you know sir francis bacon you know here you go you know um uh, so step one, ask a question. Step two, hypothesis. Step three, experiment. Analyze results, conclusion, and then ask another question. Okay? Or this one, start with a purpose. Start by doing background research. Start by then stating a hypothesis. Then you do the experiment, then you do the analysis, then you do the conclusion. Or it's... I don't know, there's not even a step order in this one. You start with a problem, you write down the materials you use, you have an hypothesis, you make a list of steps for your experiment. Uh, they don't actually ever do the experiment in this one. Uh, there's no experiment stuff. You just kind of write down different things. Uh, results of the experiment, I guess, maybe that counts. And then, uh, you know, you write down I heart science a bunch of times. That's very important. You have to do that at least three times. Um, this one starts with an observation, then a question, right? And so the question is step one here, and here it's step two. Uh, you start with your observations first. Like there's, it, it's interesting, right? Because like, and if you if you like look online, uh, you know, there's like the giant wheel, you know, like what stuff? I don't know, you just do them all, you know? Analyze data, interpret data, publish, retest, define question, gather information. For like it's just, I don't know, you just do all this stuff, you know. Or, you know, if graphic uh, if graphic design is your passion, you could use this one, maybe. <laughs> this this kind of hurts the, kind of hurts your eyes to look at this one. Think of interesting questions. Make observation. Formulate hypotheses. Okay, so the uh, the reason why there's all these different scientific methods and there's not like and this one's not even a loop at all. It just, it looks like it should be a loop, but nope, you're done. That's it. There's no loop on this one. Um, the reason why there's no like fixed scientific method is because science is actually different um, based on the discipline. And it's also based on the type of experiment you're doing. So for example, um, Fleming, Alexander Fleming uh, famously was working with, like strep uh let's see here this guy um he was uh he was working i think with streptococcus bacteria um and a uh, staff sorry um and uh basically he noticed that like some uh he left he came back and uh on return, he noticed that one culture was contaminated with fungus and the staph bacteria around the fungus had died. And he looked at him and was like, oh, that's weird. You know, and that's funny. Um, and then he started investigating the uh, the chemicals produced by the, by the fungus and identified uh, what he originally called was mold broth, uh, mold juice. Yeah, so uh, the original name for penicillin was mold juice. Uh, <laughs> Which is hilarious, you know. Mold juice cures gonorrhea in four hours. It probably it probably would not have been so successful. Uh, it was branding, branding, you know. 
like branding is pretty important in science you know none of these uh none of these things say you know come up with the a better name than uh, than mold juice. Uh, unfortunately, marketing is not on here, but it uh, it's kind of important. You know, I don't, I don't think I don't think so many soldiers would have uh, taken mold juice to, to their gonorrhea. Um, but that's a different that's a different process than how a lot of science takes place, right? So why it's called phlegm? No, I I think it's called penicillin because the the um the fungus or whatever the mold that uh, was a penicillin. Uh, fungus or mold or whatever. I think I think it was named after the thing that made it. But mold juice is like. I want to start calling it mold juice again. I think I think we should bring that back. It's like, you know, it's like some World of Warcraft. You know, like this is how like medicine works. Uh, you know, in the Forsaken and World of Warcraft, right? Like, here, here's some mold juice. Oh, that feels so much better. Um. Yeah, so when so when Alexander Fleming was doing uh, his groundbreaking research, and by the way, nobody cared. <laughs> like twenty years went by, and he's like, "Hey guys, I got a cure for like bacteria." And nobody cared for like a long time. Like he gave a talk, and people were like, oh, "Okay, you know." Our... Um, but when he was doing that, like he was not following this scientific method here. Like he didn't sit down and look at the fungus and went purpose. I'm going to do research, you know? No, he didn't. Uh, <clears throat> he might've done, I don't know. He may, maybe this one, right? He made an observation. Oh, that's funny. And then he asked a question like, I wonder if this fungus kills uh, bacteria. And then he's like, maybe if I isolate the, uh, the mold juice, uh, you know, it'll kill bacteria. And he does an experiment and it did, you know? And so my point here is that like, there's different ways that people do science. Um, and there is no scientific method. There's a collection of related approaches that people take that we call the scientific method. Uh, it's not, it's not some fixed thing. Uh, for example, um, uh, how many people here know what a meta analysis is or a, a meta study? I've probably got some on my computer here. Anyone know what a meta analysis is? It's very different from, you know, looking at dead staff or it is right um you know has anyone seen uh, a meta-analysis before nobody okay i'll explain it. so a meta-analysis is when you do research by reading other research and a lot of times this is considered one of the highest levels of quality of research because Individual research, you know, papers can be flawed. And so what happens is that rather than looking at one paper, uh, they started by looking at 4,000 papers, okay, on the subject. And, and this paper is on your ocean traits, the big five personality, um, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism are considered the five important personality traits of, of humanity. And so what they did was they looked at 4,000 papers on the topic of personality traits and internet use. And they filtered them down to 40 that are probably the highest quality and the most relevant to the uh, questions that they were asking. And then uh, they looked at 295 results from those 40 papers, aggregated them all together, and then developed uh, conclusions. For example, people that are highly agreeable don't use the internet as much as people who are disagreeable. What? What disagreeable people use the internet more? <laughs> Explain so much about uh, Reddit and Facebook. <laughs> so uh, this is a meta study, right? And so the, the a meta study will typically start by explaining how they filtered down the, you know, how do they do the search? How do they get the papers? How do they filter them? Um, there's typically a section in here uh, on that. Let's see here. It's all background information, study aim, methods, sample. So, the, so the, these are the search terms they used to search 
these databases, then in order to be included in the study, they had to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And so they, they explain how they like filter down to the, the things. Then they explain how they combine the data from the different things, and they present the results and do graphs and cool things like that. So uh, that is not this, right? They did not make an observation and ask a question made a hypothesis and then find out was I successful or not? Oh, I wasn't successful. Start over like that process is completely wrong for when you're doing a meta analysis. That's just completely wrong. Um, that's not how a meta analysis works with a meta analysis. Uh, actually, this one's probably pretty good purpose. I want to find out what effect the personality traits have on internet use research. Yeah. Okay, cool. This is probably, I flipped randomly to the right slide, I guess. Research, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna grab as much research as we can. Uh, hypothesis. Uh, I don't even know if they've bothered with the hypothesis. They don't need to. They can just run the experiment, you know, such as it is. It's not actually an experiment. Like, a lab, like it's not an experiment where like you can find your hypothesis to be wrong, which is a common, uh, you know, if we look at, a, you know, these things, right? Uh, you, develop, you develop a testable prediction. Now, with a meta-analysis, you typically don't. You just run the stats, right? You're just like, all right, here are the numbers, average them all together, here's the answer. Like, you don't make a hypothesis. And, like, I think that agreeable people will use the internet more. Oh, darn, I was wrong. I have to go back to the direct... No, they don't do that. Like, that's not how it works. You know, they don't develop a testable prediction. They, they don't you know, reject the hypothesis. What they do is they just gather all the studies and then they find out, oh, look, if you're agreeable, uh, if you're disagreeable, you tend to use Reddit more, you know? <laughs> you know, it's true. Uh, so, um, like, you don't reject, like, n like it's not how it works, you know? Uh, you know, analyze results. You know, it's true. Report the results. If it's false report the results and think and try again. No, none of this is like how it works, right? So, uh, this is probably the closest one to what they do, but they don't, they don't really do an experiment. Instead, they do analysis, right? They, they don't make an, a hypothesis. They don't make an experiment. They don't reject the hypothesis. They just do analysis. They just do a ton of research and then they do mathematical analysis on it and they report the results. And that's considered one of the highest levels of reliability in science. The, the meta-analysis is, uh, you know, because you're, you're synthesizing the results of, you know, lots and lots of papers. You guys are being very quiet on Discord right now. So, you know, give me, give me your thoughts on, uh, on all of this. You haven't, you haven't said anything in 12 minutes. Um, yeah, so the way that Kuhn puts it is that uh, science is what scientists do. <laughs> so, you know, what is the scientific method? The scientific method is whatever it is scientists do. Like, he just punts on that one. Like, whatever, whatever it is they do. Um, you know, like how astrophysics works is very different from how, you know, Fleming did his penicillin study, right? Astrophysics people, they make observations of the heavens and they do a lot of mathematical simulations because they don't have experiments. Like you can't put a black hole in a test tube. So they do a lot of numerical simulations. Like one of my jobs back in the day was working with, um, you know, astrophysics simulations and things like that. And you, people will say, well, what if, uh, you know, what if gravity works slightly differently? Well, let's, well, let's find out, you know? And so you change the strength of gravity and then you see how galaxy formation works. If gravity was stronger or weaker, and you know that's your experiment. But it's it's not a real experiment. It's just you know plugging numbers into a simulation. But is it? A re I mean, maybe you know maybe you'd consider that a real experiment. But it's not like you're actually making a galaxy, right? You just run the numbers. So scientific method could be anything as long as the scientist is doing it. I mean, that's that's what Kuhn would say. You know. Um, but you know, what if what if they're fraudulently doing science? Then is that the scientific method? Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, is economic science? Uh, I would argue economics is a science. It's um, 
it makes observations of how people spend money and habits and you know you can do natural experiments in uh, economics all the time for example you might have one county raise their sales tax rate and the neighboring county lowers it or leaves it the same and then you can see are people buying cars did did people in this county start going to this county to buy cars because you save one percent on the price of your car it's you know buy a thirty thousand dollar car that's three hundred dollars you save by a one one percent difference in sales tax right so what qualifies you to be a scientist typically speaking uh anybody can be a scientist kind of but it, typically speaking we want to see pe somebody have a graduate degree in science right um we, d we typically don't trust somebody with no high school education to do particle accelerator experiments and things like that. So if it goes in any kind of scientific steps in science, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I think the most accurate one, uh, it's probably this, like, yeah, there's just these things and you just kind of do them. <laughs> there's like, yeah, it's a collection, uh, you know, you gather data, you analyze data, you publish. Yeah, you know. So, um, I always used to get in trouble for not following the scientific method. I mean, it, it's true. Like, you, you can do science badly. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not, I'm not justifying every approach towards science. I'm just saying there is no holy and sacred saying, you know, scientific method. There is no such thing as the scientific method. There are many scientific methods. Okay. And that's, again, not like last time we talked about pseudoscience. There are plenty of things that are not science, you know, so this is not like a, a rejection of science and by any means. I'm just saying like, it's complicated, right? And the reality is complicated. And even within the same field, if you're doing a meta-analysis, your steps are going to be different than if you're doing like a lab experiment. Like, how, how did you guys do the scientific method, like when you were uh, in high school, like Dulce or, or everyone else, actually? Like if you're in a chemistry lab, if you're in a physics lab, what steps did you guys take to do science? I'll, I'll pause the recording here and give you guys a chance to respond. All right, cool. So yeah, in, in high school, college, high school especially though, the, uh, the teachers will typically give you a sheet and they're like, here, here are the steps you do. You're going to take these chemicals, you're going to add them to this thing, you're going to put them on the Bunsen burner, you're going to stir it up, you're going to do this, you're going to write down the pH value. And uh, what's funny about that is, yeah, they're teaching you the scientific method, such as it is, um, you know, and, and they might have you, like, predict what will happen in advance. In reality, like, scientists typically don't do that. Like, we don't bother, like, predicting what our experiment will do. It's like, you know, if, if I'm going to do a study to see uh, what percentage of computer science students cheat using chat GPT, I mean, I might have some sort of internal, like, estimate or something, but... Like when you write a paper, you just say, I did an experiment. We observed these people, 20% of them cheated. There you go. Like, you know, the, the whole, like, you know, hypothesis formation and rejection, like it, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, um, it's sort of leading into the notion of like null hypo, like statistical testing where you want to see if there was an effect at all. So you, you put fertilizer on tomatoes, you have a control group. You look at the difference in sizes, you get like two different bell curves and the hypothesis testing is, did the tomatoes with fertilizer grow enough that it's statistically significant? That's kind of what it's leading into. Uh, but you know, like if, you know, you can read these papers, like, you know, like I've got tons of, tons of papers on here. Like here's, here's that big one, you know, uh, you know, they say surprisingly, um, you know, like the, so clearly they had some sort of like internal model of like, you know, what kind of people use the internet, but like nowhere in here do they say like, you know, here is our hypothesis. Oh, and we were wrong. Like it, it's just not how it takes place. And also science in general doesn't work by somebody handing you a worksheet. Like when you're doing science in the real world, they don't hand you a worksheet with steps on it. Like you got to come up with all that yourself, you know? So, you know, like your high school chemistry labs, like they do that. So you get through it in a day, you know, something like that. But it's not, that's not exactly how science works. And, and it's in science, like you have to come up with the apparatus a lot of times or come up with the steps yourself or think about how you're going to do things. So, 
Okay, it's it's complicated. Now, on to part two of our lecture, the replicability crisis, so the reproduction crisis. This uh, was an atom bomb dropped on the scientific community. So in 2015, science, anytime you have a journal that's one word like nature or science, like it's a big deal. Um, what these uh, researchers did is a group of uh, psychologists. What they did was they looked at the hundred top papers in science, the most cited, the most influential, the ones that are in the textbooks. And, uh, and these are the things that created, um, you know, buzzwords like psychological priming and, uh, um, I don't know, the Flynn effect, which is rising IQs or the Blackthorn effect on the, uh, effects of changes making on productivity. There, there's a lot of like named effects like that. And they're like, all right, let's try running those experiments again. So they looked at the original paper and they recreated the experiment uh, based on the paper as best as they could. Now you can't always, you know, do it like, you know, um, you know, if, if, a, if an experiment takes place on a bridge, you know, you know, you might not have a bridge nearby. So you, you might have to, you know, kind of work with it a little bit, but, Basically, they did their best to try to re recreate as accurately as possible the 100 top papers in psychology. And what they found was only 39 of them were reproduced successfully. And many of them, many of the papers had weaker effect sizes. So the effect size is how strong the effect is, right? So, uh, for example, if I was studying uh, the effect of caffeine on a uh, programmer's productivity, which would be an amazing study. Like I, I definitely, I, I want to do this now after uh, drinking a lot of coffee. Um, the effect size would be, you know, programmers who drink caffeine uh, are 10% more effective or 80% faster at coding or something like that. The effect size is how much impact the caffeine has or the Flynn effect has uh, on IQ rates or, um, Psychological priming, right? Uh, so psychological priming, um, the the study on that one, the they would give uh, college freshmen because college freshmen are like the lab rats of the psychology world. Uh, the single most studied uh, creature on the planet is probably actually a lab rat, but like the college freshman comes in a close second because. When you're a freshman, you take a psychology class. They make you do, uh, they do experiments on you as part of being part of the class. <laughs> and so like a lot of results we get are like very specific to college freshmen. Like Americans drink a lot more when school comes back into session. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Um, hmm. uh, and so this, the psychological priming effect is, uh, uh, what they do is they'd have people fill out crosswords and they were told that the experiment was to see like how quickly they could follow the crossword or something like that. But there were, there were separated into groups. And so some of the people were given a crossword that had words related to age and aging and, and cane and arthritis and decrepitude and senescence and gray hair and, you know, things like that. And then some people had just a normal crossword puzzle. Maybe some people had a, had a, a crossword that had a lot of words associated with youth and sprightliness and sprinting and Usain Bolt, I don't know, you know. And the actual experiment was not how long it took them to solve the crossword puzzle. The experiment was after they left the room that the experiment was in, they had to walk down a hallway and leave the building. And so the researchers would time how long it took them to leave. And what they found was that uh, when, when people did crosswords that had words like age and, you know, hobbling and things like that in it, they would walk slower leaving the building than the people who, you know, read about caffeine and, <laughs> and doing the hurdles or whatever. I don't know. And then when, uh, when people tried reproducing the results, guess what? You know, uh, either it didn't reproduce or the effect size, the, you know, might have been like, if anything, a very small uh, effect. Anytime you have a paper, there are three things that are important. Every time I read a scientific paper, I do peer review. I probably peer review 10 papers a year or something like that. Two to three conferences a year, typically, uh, I do peer review for. And uh, and that's when I'm looking at research, a research paper. Not all the things I read are research papers. Like sometimes it's a position paper where it's just somebody's opinion. 
Uh, but like when I'm reading a research paper, there's three things I always look for. N, N, the letter N. N is the number of people in the study. Like how many people did you feed caffeine to? Five? Okay, that's a pretty small number, you know? Uh, you know, how many people did you test the priming effect on, right? Uh, two, the effect size. Like how much difference did it make to give people caffeine? How much faster did they code? And then three, are the results statistically significant? Uh, there's always randomness, right? Like you might just happen to get, you know, Chris Vienna, who's an experienced coder, and he just knocks out a program really quickly. And he might have been in the control group that was uh, caffeine free. Might confound the study. And so you need to have enough people in there. Um, and you need, you know, you need to feed them enough caffeine that it's going to have an effect. And, and then even still, there's randomness. Okay. And so statistical testing will tell you was the results due to chance or was it due to randomness? Like I said before, you know, your classic scientific experiment is the tomato fertilizer thing, right? Like you put fertilizer on tomato plants, you have a control group that doesn't have fertilizer and, you know, you grow 50 plants and then you see the average and you look at the standard distribution, you run statistical testing and it tells you are the results due to chance and what probability that it's due to chance. And so typically in science, we use a 5% threshold. So uh, we accept, in general, we'll accept a paper if it's 95% certain that the results are not due to chance. Um, and that's not, not exactly the most accurate way of putting it, but um, that's kind of the, the general idea. Okay. Now, this is a problem. Okay, and the problem here is that like, these are landmark papers, right? If you, if you told somebody Hey, I found, uh, I found this paper and it's a 50, 50 chance if it's right or not, would somebody bother reading that paper? Right? Like here's a book, flip a coin. If it's heads, the book's right. If it's tails, the book's wrong. Would you bother reading this book? What do you guys think? You're, you're cute to type things on Discord. Right? What have you learned? If, like, is science actually sciencing? Right? If every, if every paper you read is a coin toss, you actually haven't learned anything. Because it could be right or it could be wrong. And in this case, like, it's actually 60-40. It's wrong. Right? So this is why it was such a big deal in science, because, you know, these, these aren't like random, like people publishing random things. These were the most cited papers in psychology and they had a better than even odds of being wrong one way or the other. And so this undermines the entire notion of science as advancing knowledge, right? The whole point of science is that we're learning things reliably about the real world. And if you just flip a coin and write a paper, that's really bad. Why even bother doing research, right? So the land paper, landmark papers were 60% wrong in different ways, yeah. So either they, when they reproduced it, they didn't see anything. Uh, some of them had negative, like the opposite effect. And some of them, they had the effect, but it was much smaller than was reported in the, in the study. And so like, why bother doing research? Why not just flip a coin? And being like, uh, I don't know, um, you know, if you put a, if you put a towel on your head, then, uh, you know, your IQ goes up by 50 points. Flip a coin. True. Okay. There you go. Publish. All right. Why bother? Why bother doing research at all? Why bother doing peer review? If it's a coin flip, just publish anything you want. It's all, you know, does putting a towel on your head, make you smart, flip a coin, done easy, right? This is a massive problem. Now I got into an argument a few months ago with somebody online who said, well, you know, the, the replicability crisis has not, it's not a crisis. It's, there's no crisis in science right now. And they're right to a certain extent. Like psychology has still been doing its psychology thing, right? It's not like the conferences have stopped. It's not like they're not publishing, um, you know, papers anymore. It's not like they're not doing research. All that stuff is still taking place. But the, the problem is, you know, I work a lot with the National Science Foundation, the NSF. It's a big problem because... What this showed was that the way that we do science in America 
is fundamentally untrustworthy, at least in some fields like psychology. Particle physics uh, uh, is much more reliable than, than psychology. And, and part of it is just endemic to the field of psychology because the human brain is complicated. You know, like you do an experiment and maybe the, maybe the priming effect only works when you're in Canada uh, and it's the end of winter and people are like ready to like, uh, you know, come out into the springtime and be full of energy. Maybe that's, you know, it's, there's so many different ways that these things can be confounded that it, it can be hard to be reliable when you're talking about psychology, but it's not just psychology. Medicine was just as bad. Medicine had like a 50% failure rate to reproduce also too many variables. Yeah. Like human, like humans are not like chemicals, right? Like one of the problems, like I do, I do education research, right? One of the problems is that like humans are not a chemical in a test tube. You can't just like do this and this and do an experiment and be like, da, 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 there you go. Um, you know, th like if you're doing experiments on education, like there's the quality of the professor, right? Like if your professor sucks and you're like, here, um, you know, I've come up with a new teaching method, you know, uh, put a, put a towel on your head and then students will learn better. If the, if the teacher you give that to is a terrible teacher, you know, they, they're maybe not going to learn. Or maybe they will because they are just now staring at the teacher because they have a towel on their head. I don't know. You know, um, it's very complicated, right? It's hard to... So the science is the science thing. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Like the way that science works, if you're flipping a coin to get research results from the top papers, that means you're not learning anything. You have made no progress in science over the past 50 years. And that's terrifying, you know, especially to the NSF because that's their mission right, is to advance the fields of science. So the APA, which are famous for their citation, right, <laughs> system, uh, the APA released a, a statement on the reproducing, replicability rep, rep, crisis, the reproducing rep, reproduction crisis, <clears throat> saying, well, <clears throat> it's a problem in other fields as well. It's not just us. So what, uh, what fallacy is that? When somebody says, well, other fields, other fields have problems too. Not a very good defense, by the way, but what fallacy is this? The science isn't sciencing two quoqua. Yeah, very good. So, um, yeah, classic two quoqua response. Uh, well, you know, it's not our fault. Other people have problems too. Uh, yeah, it's two quoqua. And, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I teach fallacies is because you can see <clears throat> fallacies being used it, everywhere. It's not just in the media. It's not just in politics, even though those are very easy targets <laughs> to pick on. Uh, in, in science too, you know, like this is the APA, you know, they're the top science organization in, in psychology in America. And they use the two, two, two quote quote fallacy. Right? So, um, so the, the question is like, okay, why, why are we having this? Cause like, when you submit a paper, it goes through peer review, right? Somebody like me will read the paper and look at the experimental data and look at the statistical analysis and be like, okay, yeah, the odds of this uh, being due to chance are less than 5%. So how did it turn out to be 50%? You know, why, you know, how, how did, how did the system fail so badly? And one of the big problems is what we put professors through. So in academia, at a research institution, at, at your, like UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, one of these like top schools like that. Uh, if you're a professor, you are primarily engaged in research. You teach, but teaching is like uh, priority number three. Priority number one is publications. Priority number two is how much money you pull in through NSF grants and other grants. Priority number three is your teaching skills. And that's maybe the, no, no, it's, no. How good you can teach is like priority four. Priority three is like service, like serving on committees and things like that. So yeah, like we don't hire professors usually based on how well they can teach. At a community college, it's different. Community college, we just teach. Um, and so people are primarily chosen based on their teaching skills. But at a research institution, your primary goal is making the institution look good through publishing papers. And so when you get hired as a professor, you've got somewhere around the order of five years to make tenure. Uh, my daughter's like, I thought tenure took 10 years. It's in the name, right? Tenure. 
No, tenure, tenure is about five-ish, seven-ish years, depends on the institution. And basically, you're hired sort of provisionally as a professor. And it's really hard to get a professorship, right? Like, if you get hired as a tenure-track professor in psychology, like, you you are already in the top 1% of the top 1% of psychology graduates. Because everybody wants those tenure-track positions. You get 100 people applying for them, and you were selected. Now you got seven years to make a name for yourself. And if you don't make tenure, they fire you, generally speaking. They don't necessarily fire you. But, the, you know, a lot of people just quit because they're not going to get tenure. Um, and you've got seven years. And so, like, it's an incredibly stressful situation for these professors to be in. They have to generate lots and lots of papers. And so the way they do this is not through quality, usually. It's through quantity. Uh I, I reject through peer review a lot of papers that are like, here's our progress update on our on our project. We've it's been six weeks since we've last published a, a paper on what we've been doing. And all we've done since then is have meetings. So we are going to publish our meeting notes. And I'm just reading the same like who who in their right mind would want to read a paper that was just like the results of their meet. Like it's just like what we talked about and they didn't determine anything. They didn't discover any new information they didn't do anything at all they were just like meeting and and it's like here you go and i'm like no like i'm not accepting this like this is worthless you know you're you were going to cost people hours of their life reading this worthless pos but that's that's what they do because when they get when they get evaluated for their tenure they want to have that nice list of like 20 some odd papers in the past five years. In general, they're supposed to publish one paper every three months. And that's brutal. Like you are not doing, you're not discovering the next penicillin every three months. You know what I mean? Uh, you're not. Uh, it's incremental. Uh, it's like what I tell my professors when they ask for a progress check in my 10-page essay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but people actually have to get these things published somehow. And so uh, part of it is they start, uh, they start shopping around, right? Like, you know, if you don't get in at, at a top tier journal, then you you try the paper at the next tier down, and they reject you. you. Just kind of work your way down the down the line until somebody accepts your your progress notes. And some of these journals, like you, just pay the money and then they'll publish it. You know, they don't do peer review really at all. Um, another problem is that negative findings don't get published, right? So, like, if I were to try, you know, do an experiment where, like, I wanted to see, um. If caffeine uh, causes people to code faster and it, and it didn't, a lot of times people will just not publish it because like, well, I didn't find anything. But but there's value in that, right? Like like everybody thinks that coffee will make you code faster. So if you get a negative result, you should publish it because that would be interesting to somebody, right? Um, but a lot of times they don't even bother writing the paper up because they, they failed. And a lot of times the papers won't accept it because they got a negative result. And this is part of the problem. If you only publish positive results, and you don't publish negative results, then that's what leads to that, that reproduction crisis, right? Because um, the threshold for acceptance is 5% chance of, of randomness. And if, uh, if there were 20 studies and 19 of them showed no effect, and one of them showed a positive effect, and you only published the one that shows the positive effect, then you are misleading people. And, uh, and that's a problem with how our publication system works. We reward people for groundbreaking research, showing something new. Uh, we don't reward people very much if, if they get published at all for finding out that uh, there is no impact on walking speed based on the, the, the crossword puzzles you do or something like that. So it's a real systemic problem in academia. Um, my, one of my favorite professors, Bennett Yee, um, he, he uh, you know, one of my professors said, uh, you know, in academia, it's publish or perish, and he chose to perish. So, um, you know, he published one paper a year, and it was a really good paper, but it wasn't enough, right? So he didn't make tenure, so he left and got a job at Google doing Chrome OS and Chromebooks and things like that. So, you know, he worked out for him, I guess. Um, really cool guy. I liked him a lot. I, I took at least two classes with him. And it's just that kind of stuff that really just, you know, sort of pisses me off about academia. You know? Like one of my favorite professors um, at UC San Diego was a guy named Keith Muller. Mueller? Mueller? And uh, 
you know, like the, I don't, know, it, I don't want to go to the politics, but like, you know, it's just like, you know, you, you have these like professors that are amazing, but it, it doesn't match like what the university is trying to do. University is trying to pull money in predominantly and publish papers to make themselves look at. They're looking for prestige and money. And that doesn't match my personal beliefs, which is that college should be here to educate students. It's a wild, it's a wild notion, I know, but I, I feel like college should be there to teach people. It's a bit of a heretical notion, I know. Okay. Um, so yeah, so a lot of incremental work is published. Um, and a lot of incremental work gets picked up by science journalism and science journalism is like, look, there's a new study showing that, uh, you know, um, I don't know, coffee uh, stops dementia, which may, may actually be true. I, I actually read a paper on that. Um, and so there's actually been several papers that I've seen, you know, suggesting that coffee is good at protecting the brain. And so like, that's what I tell myself when I suck down all that coffee. All right. Um, and so pea fishing. So when you publish, typically speaking, you have to show that the odds that your paper was due to chance is less than 5%. But like I said, if you do 20 studies on average, you're going to expect to get one spurious positive result. So um, a lot of people are doing a lot of research. And so these spurious results will happen all the time. And if you're not publishing the negative results on the same topic and you only select if you, what fallacy is that where you're just selecting the positive result and ignoring the negative results. Anyone know what fallacy that is? Science. It's named after harvesting some fruits. Got all these studies out there. You're just picking the one that has a really interesting result. Cherry picking, very good. So, it is a cherry picking fallacy, um, and and that's that's a problem. And so, like, like I said, like this guy on Reddit was like, "Yeah, there is no there is no replication crisis," but he's looking at it from the ground, right? He's looking at it from like the level of like a researcher, where you know researchers are still going to do their research and they're still going to collect data and they're going to write a paper and publish it and stuff like that. Science hasn't stopped in the last eight years. But I'm looking at it from the perspective of the NSF, right? Because I work with the, you know, the NSF a lot. And they have, like, they've had conferences on this topic. I've read, I've read the papers on, like, how they're thinking about to change how science works in America. Because the way that it's working right now has led to an outcome where science is unreliable. Fundamentally unreliable, at least in some fields like medicine and psychology. And so... They're talking about having journals just for publishing negative results so that if you get a negative result, it's not like a waste of your life. You know, like one of my friends in college, she uh, was trying to find the genetic basis of arthritis and she had to breed genetically engineered mice and they had identified this gene they thought causes arthritis. And so they bred it into the mice. Three years later, they wait for the mice to get older or whatever. Nope, no arthritis. Or, dang. So maybe it's this gene. They breed the mice three years later. Nope. Let's try this gene. Nope. So she's been in school for like, I don't know. How old is she? Like yeah, at that point, she was probably in her late twenties, had nothing, nothing found. Right. And so she was just sort of in this endless hell cycle of like just rolling dice and hoping that she would be the person who discovered the genetic basis of arthritis and just, getting negative result after negative result and not publishing it and so forth. So, um, and so what the NSF is doing to resolve this crisis is like structural, like let's make journals to publish negative results. Let's try to do something about the publish or perish mentality in academia, you know, like maybe more, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an entrenched problem. You know, is anyone here thinking about becoming a professor? And out of curiosity, anyone here in chat want to become a professor? I really enjoy it, by the way. Like, teaching is, like, a lot of fun. I, I think you guys can tell that, that, uh, that it's highly amusing to me to teach. 
very rewarding too as well. But mostly I do it for my own amusement. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the question of like how people get tenure is a big question. Like that's a that's an entrenched problem. Um, teaching track faculty versus research track faculty. Uh, what is the purpose of a college? You know, like, I think that's a fundamental question that needs to be answered. Because, like, you know, people were paying, like, you know, full price during the pandemic. You guys remember that? Like, uh, would never want to if I was forced to publish pointless studies. You know, do you guys remember paying full price for, you know, like, people were really going to Harvard and paying 50000 a year to get a Zoom, Zoom classes and things like that? Uh, it's like... Like there's, there's some big questions right now. And, and, and what has happened in the last year, really, like this is new stuff is that people aren't coming back from the pandemic. Like the pandemic ended and people were like, okay, people are going to go back to college, right? Cause enrollment dropped during college. Cause people were like, it's not worth it to get a zoom education, right? Like Harvard does not deserve $50,000 for watching YouTube videos. I can watch YouTube videos for free, right? Uh, and so we were expecting people to return to college after the pandemic was over. What's happening is that like a lot of people are like, colleges keep raising their prices and they don't have a focus on educating the students. So why should I, why should I pay it? You know? And so I think college is going to have, I, I think there's going to be a reckoning. Honestly, I think the colleges are going to have to sit down or, or, or they'll die. Maybe <laughs> it's literally publish or perish, but you know, for the colleges, right? Like, I think they're either going to have to figure out a way of becoming more relevant and not, you know, charging people, you know, $80,000 a year, whatever ridiculous amount it is total now to, to go to Harvard. Uh, like, I, I think the college is going to have to restructure itself because right now it's it's fairly degenerate, right? Like, it's it's in this really weird place where students pay a ton of money to get an education and the colleges don't prioritize education they prioritize research and money and grant money and student tuition money as well sure but it's like you you know it's a one-sided transaction right like you give them all this money and then they don't care about you they hire a part-time person to teach your class right um so it's, it's an interesting question and this is something that's ongoing right now and it's we'll, we'll see how it shakes out like there are there are changes being made like i said at the nsf level uh, to encourage, you know, more reliability in research. But, um, I mean, if enrollment in colleges continues to go down, like, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So, the bigger a, a university is endowment, the larger the tuition, which, <laughs> which makes no sense, right? Like, like Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, they don't need to charge tuition. They have so much money that the, in their, in their endowment, the interest on their endowment could literally pay the tuition of every student. You know, there is absolutely no reason for them to be charging $80,000 a year to go to college and putting people into debt for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? Uh, it is, is yeah. So, uh, but in, until now, until recently, it's been, it's been a seller's market. Like, they can charge whatever they want, and people want that Harvard name on their resume, and so they can charge anything they want. And maybe Harvard can get away with it, but, like, if you go into the next tier down, like, are you going to pay infinite money? To get a master of fine arts, you know, probably not. How much money do the colleges make? The endowment of Harvard, and we're over time, but um, it's like billions, like five point four billion in operating expenses. My lord, uh, a large academic uh, valued at fifty three billion dollars in their endowment. So that means they just got fifty three billion in the in the bank, right? Like that's. A lot of money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ten billion dollars, twenty twenty one, right? Harvard in uh, how many people are there? Uh, yeah, so this is this is something that has been changing. So low income people at like Stanford pay nothing at Harvard. Uh, if you make under seventy five uh, k a year, you pay nothing. So. That is that is a trend that has been positive. I shouldn't be completely dunking on them, um, but like uh, two thousand people a uh, class with an endowment of 50, 50 billion. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. 
if you do the math on the on the interest rates, they could just not charge tuition if they wanted to. Uh, if you make seventy six, no. If you if you make seventy six, you pay ten percent of your income. So you'd pay seven thousand dollars if you uh, if you made seventy six thousand. So uh, yeah, Stanford uh, did that a while back. So if you if you're low income, apply to Stanford. You know, you know it's free. Anyway. So sports stadiums are important. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a giant it's a giant mess in my opinion. And so we'll see we'll see what happens over the next ten years. It's going to be an interesting question. Like can can colleges remain relevant? You know, do people think they're getting their money's worth? Do they think that the education they get from a person who predominantly does research is is worth the extra the extra cost? These are all questions I don't have the answer to. But uh, I do know that people are working on it, and so I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Okay, so have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about your capstone essay, uh, which is your big your big essay you're going to write uh, by the end of the semester. And just have a great weekend. I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys next time.